to the all right so thanks everybody thank you so much for being here tonight and for your interest in learning a bit more about alaskan caribou and how we are using caribou migration to help support management and conservation uh, before i hop into talking about my research, I just want to give a little bit of uh, kind of my background. So I actually grew up in Southern California. I grew up loving wildlife, really interested in animals, whether that was in zoos or out in the wild. And so when I went to college, I pursued a bachelor's degree in animal biology from the University of California at Davis. And that's where I really got my first taste with wildlife research, uh, first in a study abroad program in Kenya, and then doing my senior practicum studying the American badger in Monterey, California. And I loved that experience, so decided to go to grad school. I went to the University of Florida, where I got a master's degree in interdisciplinary ecology and a PhD in geography. And I did my research there studying elephants in Southern Africa. So I spent a fair bit of time over in Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa studying elephant movement and habitat use and impacts on vegetation and large herbivores. So that was really incredible experiences getting to do that. And then after I graduated, I came to work for the Wilderness Society here in Alaska. So I am a senior ecologist with the Wilderness Society. And for those who don't know, the Wilderness Society is a National Nonprofit Conservation Organization. We were founded in 1935 and have a mission of uniting people to protect America's wild places. Now, we do that in a whole bunch of different ways, everything from lobbying on Capitol Hill to local action, but we have a science team that I am part of who is tasked with doing new research in partnership with agencies and local stakeholders and using that information to advocate for the use of the best available science to inform decision making. And so that is most of what my job consists of, which is what I'll be talking to you about tonight. Uh, but enough about me, you came here probably to hear more about caribou. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking to you about barren ground caribou, which the Inupiaq people of northern and western Alaska call tutu, and the Gwich'in people of northeastern Alaska and into Canada call Banzai. So before I talk about bare ground caribou in Alaska, though, it's worth setting the broader context. And caribou actually occur across um, the Arctic. Here in North America, we call the wild animals caribou, and we call domesticated animals reindeer, whereas in Europe and Asia, they call both wild and domestic animals reindeer. But whether you're talking about reindeer or caribou, they're all the same species, range of And so that's what we're talking about tonight. Now, in Alaska, uh, caribou occur across the state. Each of the areas that you see here with a number and a color represents a different caribou herd. And so you can see they occur all the way from way out on the Aleutian Islands to the Kenai Peninsula near where I'm based in Anchorage and up to the North Slope where the big barren ground migratory herds live, which is what I focus most of my work on. So in the North Slope, there are four different caribou herds, the Western Arctic caribou herd going from west to east, the Deshekpuk caribou herd, the Central Arctic caribou herd, and the porcupine caribou herd. And most of my research deals with the Western Arctic herd and the Deshekpuk herd. So those are the two I'm gonna be talking mostly about tonight. Now, as we think about caribou and especially barren ground caribou, one of the key characteristics of these Northern herds is movement. You know, caribou move a ton. A study of the Western Arctic herd by colleagues of mine in the National Park Service found that on average, caribou walk around 2,000 miles every year. And one individual they were tracking covered about 2,700 miles. So these caribou are covering large distances. And to illustrate this movement and how it ends up defining uh, life for caribou, I wanna walk through a year in the life of a caribou herd. And so to do that, I'll switch over to the Deshekpuk caribou herd, the other herd that I study, and we'll look across their annual range, which you see in the red outlined area here, that encompasses sort of all the area where animals in this herd go throughout the year. And then this circle on the right will have a different periods throughout the year in which they tend to show similar movement behaviors or space use. And I should point out that the dates in this uh, 
kind of year slice, they're, they're really approximate. You know, they generally represent what kinds of behaviors go on, but there's a lot of variability from year to year and from individual to individual in what the caribou are doing. So we'll start out in the fall when caribou begin their epic migration. And in the Tshekpuk caribou herd, many of the caribou travel down to the south, but others stay up on the coastal plain uh, all winter long. And this also is when the rut takes place, setting uh, the way for the next generation of young caribou. Now, after fall migration comes the long, cold winter. And this is a period where caribou don't move nearly as much, although I say that and then it's always surprising to see how much the caribou actually do move. I was just looking at some new caribou data uh, before joining this talk, and there's a fair bit of movement in the winter, but compared to other times of the year, they're not moving as far. So they're more sedentary, partly because of deep snow and other factors. There's not a lot of food out there for them. And so during this winter period, caribou end up subsisting a lot on both stored body resources they built up during the summer and also on food like the lichen that you see here. And so that's enough to be able to get them through the winter. And once they get through the winter, around April, caribou begin their spring migration. And this is a time when the pregnant females hurry up to the calving ground and males lag behind. Now, it's really important that those females uh, hurry up to the calving ground because pretty soon it's time for them to have their babies. So in the Tshekpuk caribou herd, uh, they get that name because they have their wrapped calves around Tshekpuk Lake. And the females group all together in a big bunch and then in a very short amount of time have all their calves. And this is a strategy that they use to help protect the calves from predators. So they bunch up, have all the calves in a really short window of time, and then those calves grow up really quickly. And in only a few days, they're able to run and to keep up with the herd. I work with colleagues um, from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game who say if they don't go out there when they're collaring those newborn calves and get that done within about two days, they can't catch the caribou anymore. They're that fast within just a few days of life. So that's uh, calving. And it's a good thing that those caribou grow up and are able to move quickly because very soon the herd is on the move again. And as they go into summer, the herd tends to move up toward the coast and to other windy areas because that's when the bugs start coming out. So you have mosquitoes and later flies that uh, come and uh, will feed upon the caribou. And they can have a really strong impact. You know, mosquitoes actually can take over four pounds of blood from a single caribou throughout the course of a summer. There are literally trillions of mosquitoes up on the North Slope of Alaska. And they end up really influencing how caribou move across the landscapes. You see really strong dynamics, even from days when uh, the bugs are out and days when it's windy and you don't have as much insect activity, caribou are varying their behavior and where they go. So these insects have a really strong effect. But later in the summer, those insect numbers die down and then caribou spread out more and they take advantage of all the a uh, brief growing season of plants like the cotton grass that you see here to feed on that both to support the calves that they have and also to try to regain their body stores so they can build up reserves to get them through the next migration and winter period. And then the whole cycle starts over again. So that's a year in the life of caribou, but how do we know where they actually are and what they're doing at different times of the year, especially when they're so far away from where people live? Well, we know where the caribou are going because of GPS telemetry. So just like your phones have GPS to tell where you are and where you want to go, uh, caribou, some of the caribou, get fitted with GPS collars that record their movements over space and time. And so Basically, the way that works is you put a collar onto a caribou and that collar sends signals up to a satellite, which then transmits those locations down to an uh, analyst at a computer. And so we can see the locations as the caribou moves across the landscape and can relate that to different parts of the environment, like rivers or vegetation. And that helps us to understand not only where the animals are going, but also what they're interacting with and what they're doing on the landscape. And so I'll be talking to you a bit more about that later on tonight. Um, what's neat though is uh, how they actually get those collars on. 
So the collaring is done by colleagues of mine with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and the National Park Service uh, and the North Slope Borough. And for the Western Arctic herd, for many, many years, the caribou in swimming across the same river, in fact, at the same river crossing on the Kobuk River. And year after year, the caribou would come back to this area. And so the scientists started taking advantage of that. And they actually would come up in boats while the caribou were swimming across the river and would grab a hold of the caribou to put on collars. And the neat thing about that, what makes that possible is that caribou actually float. So if you look at this top picture, this is a caribou hair that is under a scanning electron microscope and it's blown up to about 300 times magnification. And you can see the bubble-like structures in there, kind of like bubble wrap. And they serve a similar purpose. They actually trap air within those structures. And that air uh, serves as a good insulator. So it helps to keep the caribou warm during frigid Arctic conditions. But they also uh, help make the animal float. So they work kind of like wearing a life jacket. Now, human hair, as you can see in the bottom image, we don't have those same kind of structures, which is why we need jackets and we need life jackets. Um, and the caribou don't. But for the scientists, it's really helpful to have caribou that float because it means they just bob along in the water, the boats are able to come alongside, and without having to drug them or put nets on them or other things like that, they can just grab a hold, they can take any measurements they need to, and they can attach on a collar. And being in the water helps keep the animals from overheating because they're so well adapted to a cold environment that on the ground, they can overheat really quickly. So it's a really neat way of getting the collars onto the caribou. But unfortunately, it doesn't work everywhere, both when the caribou change up their migration, like we've been seeing in some recent years, and for other herds like the Tshekpuk herd, where they're not always swimming across the same rivers, the scientists need to use other approaches to get the collars onto caribou. And for that, they mainly rely on helicopters. So what they'll do is they'll come up in a helicopter uh, near a caribou that they want to collar, and they'll actually fire a net out of that helicopter, wrap up the caribou, and then they'll hop out of the helicopter, run over, put a blindfold on the animal to help keep it calm, and then they'll get any measurements and attach the collar to them and then let them go. And so either way, whether it's by boat or by helicopter, the scientists are out there putting collars out on these animals that let us understand where they're going and what they're doing. So once we have all that information about where caribou go, what do we do with it? I want to share about a few research projects that I've been involved with as examples of how caribou movement information is used to help inform management and conservation. So one project that we published last year looked at migration patterns and winter use in the Tshekpuk caribou herd. And like I mentioned before, the GPS collars that I've been talking about they basically give you a bunch of dots across the landscape showing where the animal's gone throughout the year. So here, all these grayish dots show the locations of one caribou over the span of a year from just after calving until the next year shortly after calving. Now, based on different movement characteristics of that caribou throughout the year, we're able to identify which of those locations correspond to different seasons. So for example, this caribou wandered around during the summer in the brown, orange, and yellow uh, locations, and then fall migration hit, and all those red dots you can see represent the animal moving suddenly to the south. And it then clustered up for the winter in the area with all those blue dots. You can see where they're not moving nearly as far uh, during that period, stayed there all winter long, and then it went back in the spring in the green path, moving back up north, clustered up for a little bit under that bright pink color, and then wandered off with a paler pink um, after that, heading back toward the coast to get ready for the next bout of insects to come. So this is just one year from one caribou. Um, and yet, I mentioned before that, you know, this individual, it migrated away from the North Slope, went down into the mountains, and then came back. But they don't all do that. In the Tshekpuk herd, uh, the majority of individuals actually spend the winter up on the coastal plain. And so we get this variability across individuals. And using the collar data, looking across all the individuals, we found that migration was by far the dominant strategy, with most caribou that we looked at showing some sort of migration. But there was a lot of variability from year to year in terms of how far they went and in terms of how many individuals migrated at all. 
So partial migration describes when one part of a herd migrates and the other part stays uh, in place where the summer range is. And we saw that in some years, all of our colored caribou would migrate. In other years, it was much lower, even down around 50%. So there's variability from year to year in what happens. And these patterns lead to different patterns in space use over time. So this map shows relative winter use for 76 adult female caribou over 11 years, and the warmer colors indicate higher amounts of use by the herd. And you can see they sort of cluster out into different areas. And we actually use that to identify four main areas where the caribou were spending the winter, two up on the coastal plain and two down more around the mountains or even below the main mountain range, the Brooks Range. Then what we wanted to know is not just where those areas were, but how use of those areas by caribou changed over time. And what we found was high variability in use of those winter areas. So we saw from, I guess, the, the bar graph you see here on the right-hand side shows use of those four different winter areas. The different colors represent different winter areas being used with different years there along the x-axis. And you can see that multiple areas were used every year that we monitored. And none of the areas were used every single year, at least by the caribou that we had collar. And this shows a variability in the herd and also a need for sort of redundancy in uh, winter areas. They're going multiple places and they're not always going back to the same ones. But we were curious to know why we were seeing that pattern. You know, was it just because we were tracking different individuals over time, but the individuals always did the same thing? Or was it because caribou actually are changing up from year to year where they individually go? And the neat thing was we were able to use information from caribou that had been collared for multiple years to help get at that question. And so we actually were able to calculate the probability given where a caribou was one winter, where it would be likely to go the next winter. So here you see in the rows, the four winter areas where an animal was in a given year, and then in the columns uh, where they'd be the next year. And if we look across the diagonal there, which shows the likelihood of going back to the same area where they spent the previous year, we can see there's a fairly low probability. It's lower than 50-50 for almost all of the areas except for the really highly used Western coastal area. And this variability that occurs uh, occurs at the individual level. So what this showed us is that it's not just that we're tracking different individuals over time, but that individual caribou actually change up their patterns of what they do from year to year over time. They're using different strategies over time. Well, that's great, but who cares? Why do we even want to know probabilities of where they're going to go? Are they going to go back to the same area or not? Well, it turns out that developing a better understanding of these kinds of migration and winter use patterns has implications for understanding human impacts on caribou. So I've been showing you figures of winter use that look like this, but in reality, caribou find themselves amidst a network of human development and activity. And so they have places where there are roads or there are communities or there's oil and gas development or exploration, other things that they um, interact with. And yet these aren't just randomly distributed across the landscape, they're concentrated in certain areas. So if caribou are going back to that orange wintering area every single time, they're gonna be a lot closer to a lot of the development and the exploration activity than if they're going to some of these other areas. So it really matters what caribou are doing from year to year to understand what the potential impacts could be from human activities. Now, so far, most of the development has been around the edge of the herd range, as you can see here, but there are proposals for uh, new development. There's newly permitted things like those roads you see in purple, as well as oil and gas leases that stretch across areas, and this shows potential for development in other areas. And so managers need to better understand winter use and migration patterns to be able to make decisions that can minimize conflicts um, as they're figuring out where to allow future activities to occur. And there are proposals that go beyond just what we show on this map. So there's another project that we published last year where we looked at the potential effects of a road network that had been proposed across Northern Alaska, um, looking at what the effects of that might be for the Western Arctic herd. 
So this map that you see here is similar to the one that you just saw, except we've switched herds over to the Western Arctic herd. And now the intensity of use by the herd is shown in blue, where the darker blue shading indicates more use by the Western Arctic herd across the year. So now we're looking across the full year, not just at the winter, and we're looking at a different herd. And then you also can see in that gray dashed line, the proposed Arctic Strategic Transportation and Resources, or ASTAR, road network. If completed, these roads would cut across much of the herd range. Now, I should point out that no final routing for these roads has been determined, and the maps have changed multiple times, so it's far from clear if and where any of these roads could end up. But we wanted to use this as one example that had been put forth as to what road development could look like in this area to show that we can use tools to help understand what the effects of those roads might be before they go in, all in the name of helping managers make better decisions. So what we did is we used information about how caribou select for or against uh, avoiding or selecting for rugged terrain, major rivers, dense vegetation, and roads. And then we used this information about how caribou respond to these different parts of the environment to map out migratory connectivity for the herd in both the fall and spring migration. This was represented by something called current flow, which uh, basically used an analogy sort of like the electric current running through the circuit boards in your computer to understand how animals move across a landscape, places that have more resistance to movement and less resistance to movement. Um, but ultimately, it's a way to represent connectivity across the landscape, especially for migratory species like caribou. So we mapped out this connectivity for caribou, and then we looked at what the potential implications might be for people if the A-star roads were developed. So we said, based on the response to roads that we observed, based on existing roads, what might happen if the A-star roads were put in? And what might happen for caribou and what might happen for people? So with that, uh, we looked at areas around where people live. So the dots on this map show different communities within the range of the herd. And we looked within about 20 kilometers of each of those communities. And the color of the dots here represent uh, predicted increases in red or decreases in blue of the flow of caribou through those areas. And so what you can see is that even though on the edges of the herd range, uh, connectivity might increase, the, those are the periphery of the range. The numbers are likely to be fairly low. In the core of the movement areas, it tends to predict, or there's a number of places where the roads are predicted to have a decreasing effect on migratory connectivity for this herd. And that's potentially concerning for people who rely on caribou for food security and for their cultural and spiritual well being. You know, for example, in Anaktuvik Pass, which is predicted to show decreased flow, caribou make up over 80% of the total subsistence harvest. And so disruption to that harvest could have strong negative impacts on uh, the people. Now, this here was a way, again, not to say what would happen in case of this particular proposal, but to say, look, we can use these kinds of tools to evaluate proposals once they're made to understand what those impacts might be. But what do you do if there hasn't been a specific development proposal and yet decisions need to be made about what kinds of lands are going to be open or closed to development? Well, the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska, or the NPRA, is the largest single unit of federally managed land in the entire country. And it contains the calving grounds of both the Western Arctic herd, which you see in the dark blue here, and the Teshekpuk herd, which you see in red. Now, land management within the NPRA is governed by an integrated activity plan, which sets up a balance between protecting important species, subsistence, and other values, and allowing for oil and gas development. And it does this by setting large areas of land aside as being unavailable for oil and gas leasing while making other areas available. And so the hashed areas that you can see on this map were made unavailable for leasing under the 2013 Integrated Activity Plan, which left roughly half of the area available for oil and gas development and about half set aside for protecting wildlife and subsistence and other values. But in 2017, the Bureau of Land Management began revising the plan to change up 
the amount of area that would be available for leasing. And importantly, this was done before specific proposals for development had been put forth, which created uncertainty around what the effects might be of making different areas available for development. So we wanted to come up with an approach that would allow us to analyze potential effects of the different alternatives that were being considered by the Bureau of Land Management on wildlife. The problem is, you know, we don't have a crystal ball that shows us exactly where development is going to occur and thus what the impacts will be. So instead, we relied upon a neat approach that was developed by my predecessors, Ryan Wilson and Wendy Loya. They used what are called Monte Carlo simulation models. And basically, like the casino games from which they get their names, these models use random variation and repeating things over and over and over to help deal with uncertainty and get an idea of future conditions. If that doesn't make much sense, I'll explain a little bit more of how that works. Um, basically what we did, we looked at five different alternatives for what development restrictions could look like under a new integrated activity plan. We took four that were proposed by the Bureau of Land Management, and one that came from a stakeholder group. And in these uh, images that you see here, the areas in white would be set aside, no infrastructure allowed, areas in black would allow infrastructure, and the gray areas are somewhere in between. Infrastructure is allowed, but subject to certain restrictions. And then for each of these five uh, development alternatives, we basically did three things. We started by simulating energy infrastructure locations based on realistic constraints. Then we used the results of prior scientific studies to calculate expected impacts to wildlife under each of those development scenarios. And then we repeated this many times to help reflect uncertainty. So to simulate infrastructure, we took the development restrictions that I just showed you and we multiplied them by estimates of how much undiscovered oil people think is out there and also by water bodies, uh, which are challenging to build on top of. And we use that to represent the relative likelihood of developing gravel pads for oil and gas development, which you can see in the, in the kind of middle right-hand figure where the yellower colors represent a higher likelihood of new oil and gas pads being built. For each of those, we started out by generating uh, central processing facilities or CPFs, which are the hub of industrial development. So we randomly generated between three to seven new central processing facility locations proportional to that relative pad likelihood and constrained to be at least 35 kilometers apart based on what we've observed um, from past development. For each of those central processing facilities, then, we generated four to eight satellite production pads where the actual drilling for oil and gas occurs um, in an area around them. And so that was done both proportional to that relative pad likelihood and with different distance constraints. And then we linked everything up with gravel roads, which we simulated using a different set of restrictions and using water bodies as a deterrent because you can build bridges, but they're pretty expensive. Um, and then we built least cost paths to connect up the different satellite pads and central processing facilities. And so that gave us one single complete iteration of what simulated development could look like, like you see in this figure on the right. And once we had that information, we were ready to calculate potential impacts to wildlife. And this was done for the Tshekpuk and Western Arctic caribou herds, along with eight species of shorebirds and black brant, though tonight I'm not going to talk about the bird uh, results. So for each of the caribou herds, we use previously published resource selection function analyses that basically represent suitable habitat for calving caribou. You can see that here where the warmer colors indicate a higher likelihood of calving for each of those herds. And what we did is we took the top 25% of those habitat values to represent high quality habitat based on previous studies that have been done. Now, we took that information and we discounted that calving habitat near simulated infrastructure. We set the suitability of habitat to zero where it was directly overlapped by infrastructure, and we discounted it within four kilometers of new development based on previous studies that show that mother caribou with new calves avoid areas within about four kilometers of development. 
So basically, as an example, we took a calving suitability um, representation like you see here, and we overlaid on top of it the simulated infrastructure. And as you can see in the inset map here, values near infrastructure were decreased. And then with that, we were able to calculate the amount of high quality habitat in which the values drop below that top 25% threshold, basically where that high quality habitat was lost. So for this particular example, all the areas you see in the dark blue um, are high quality habitat that no longer meets that threshold. It's been lost, whereas the light purple areas are remaining high quality habitat. And so for this particular situation, uh, it predicts 21% roughly of the high quality calving habitat would be lost. Now at this point, we had simulated infrastructure locations and we'd calculated some of the expected impacts to wildlife, but this is just one possible development scenario. And the odds are really good that the actual build out sometime in the future wouldn't look exactly like that. And that's where the Monte Carlo approach came in. What we did is we repeated this procedure 100 times for each of the management alternatives with a different random build out of development to try to reflect a variety of different potential development options. None of these are going to exactly reflect what the future reality will look like, but we wanted to capture the range of possible future development that could occur and thus get a sense of the amount of uncertainty in what the impacts could be for wildlife. What we found is for the Chekput caribou herd, more habitat tended to be lost under less protective alternatives like C and D, um, which made the greatest amount of habitat available for development. Now, that's not super surprising. The less area you have set aside as protected, the more you would expect impact to happen. But it reinforces the importance of protecting some of these areas, especially the areas around the Lake where the herd calves. And this is concerning because the alternative that the Bureau of Land Management ended up selecting actually had a little less area protected from leasing than in our alternative D. And they ended up making all of the area around Shekpuk Lake available for leasing. Uh, so it points out some kind of discrepancies from the approach that was taken and what the models are saying will best protect the caribou. Now for the Western Arctic herd, uh, the results were a little bit different we actually found the no action alternative that kept the protections from the 2013 plan under alternative A led to the greatest predicted habitat loss. And this was a bit surprising to us, but I think it reflects opportunities to build upon the existing plan. So as you can see in the figure here, um, shown in the area that circled, the northern part of the big area that's set aside to protect uh, the Western Arctic herd calving grounds is lower under alternative A, under the existing plan, compared to each of the other alternatives. And it turns out that area was left available for development back when the plan was finalized in 2013 because there was interest in building a pipeline across the reserve to get oil from offshore drilling over to the Trans-Alaska pipeline. But now, we can look back and see that that offshore drilling never actually happened. It didn't take place and there is an interest in having that trans reserve pipeline like there used to be. And so our results actually show the benefits of um, going back and raising that northern boundary again, better protecting the calving area for the Western Arctic herd, building upon the plan. So there's a lot more that I could say about this work and its potential impacts. Um, but I thought it was neat as an example of how caribou movement studies and computer simulation modeling can be used to help address questions that are relevant to conservation management. No matter how good your research and models are, however, to actually make conservation management work, it requires working with people. And so I wanna talk briefly about partnerships and the role that they play. Um, you know, like I said, producing research is really important, but actually seeing effective conservation management means that we need partnerships. And these come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. But one that I'm involved with that I'll talk a little bit about tonight is with the Western Arctic Caribou Herd Working Group. Now the working group is comprised of subsistence hunters from across the range of the herd, other Alaskan hunters, reindeer herders, hunting guides and transporters, and conservationists. And we work together to review information and recommend action to natural resource managers and to agencies that help support the group's mission 
of working together to ensure the long-term conservation of the Western Arctic herd and the ecosystem on which it depends so that we can maintain traditional and other uses that benefit people now and into the future. Uh, now, being involved in this group really has provided an amazing opportunity to get to listen to and to learn from the perspectives of people who are living on the land with the caribou and have traditional knowledge that stretches back for generations, um, while also having the opportunity to bring my scientific knowledge and expertise and for us to be able to work together to pursue creation of sustainable management recommendations to help benefit the herd and its habitat. And these kinds of jointly built uh, solutions are especially important when we face conservation challenges. You know, for example, I mentioned earlier on the Western Arctic herd has, or I guess I didn't mention it, it was up on the slide, has about 188,000 individuals, which is a lot of caribou. But I didn't mention that that's less than half of what the herd was back in the early 2000s. And so over about the last 20 years, we've seen a fairly sustained and sharp decline in the size of the herd. And that has real implications for people. So you might be able to see that there's a faint pink line here running right around the 200,000 caribou um, mark. And that's there for a reason because it corresponds to one of the management thresholds that comes from the working group's cooperative management plan. So you can see here that the 2021 count is just a little bit below that line and that drops the herd in this management table that we have here from a conservative declining down to a preservative declining uh, status. And that comes with implications. It comes with potential implications for harvest, which could lead to reducing the amount of caribou that are able to be hunted. And this is really serious stuff. I mean, we're talking about people's food security, about their cultural well-being, and about their livelihoods at risk if the amount of harvest that's allowed goes down. And so there are going to be hard discussions ahead that need to happen and need to take place, hard decisions that need to be made. But it makes me extra glad to be part of the Western Arctic Caribou Working Group in which we can have those discussions, we can listen to and learn from one another, and we can work together to try to jointly make management recommendations. So I could keep going with this all night long, but I don't want to do that to you. Um, instead, I want to turn it over to you. So I'll say thank you to all my collaborators and funders who support this work. And then I want to turn it over to you for some questions. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, great. If you have any questions, throw them into the chat. We do have several already lined up, so I'll get started on those. And some of them were direct messages to myself, so um, I will be reading those off. Um, so Tim, do caribou from one herd ever move to another herd or are they spatially like in time and place separate enough that movement between herds simply doesn't occur? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, it does happen. And that is one of the challenging things with understanding caribou and what they do. You know, for management purposes, it's really helpful having herds designated. From the perspective of caribou, it's a lot harder to know how much they pay attention to, oh, I'm part of this herd now, oh, I'm part of that herd now. Um, the way that herds get distinguished in Alaska is based on where the animals calve. So they all come together and they show pretty high fidelity. They tend to go back every year to the same general calving area and use a fairly limited uh, space for calving. So like you saw in that image of the National Petroleum Reserve of Alaska, um, the Western Arctic herd tends to calve in one area, the Tshekbuk herd tends to calve in another area, and that helps to distinguish which animals they are. But at other times of the year, they might mix together a little bit more. Now, there was a study that was done by some of my colleagues that specifically looked at this question of transfer between herds. And what they found is that sometimes the smaller herds will transfer animals into the big herds, but it's a lot more rare for the big herds to transfer into the smaller ones. It just doesn't happen very much based on the collared animals uh, that they've been studying. So some people have wondered, oh, is that what's going on when we see decreases like in the Western Arctic herds, just that all the animals moved over into the Tshekbuk herd or the Central Arctic herd? And it seems like the science is saying no they're not likely to do that. You might have some animals moving from the Tshekbuk into the Western Arctic. You're not seeing big numbers moving the other way. But yeah, it's a really good question. Awesome, great. 
Um, next question. We actually had a, a few questions in regards to insects <laughs> and again, how they relate to the caribou. So um, I'll touch on those. Are there any bird species that predate on the mosquito swarms? Yes, I am not very knowledgeable about birds and their behavior, so I don't want to speculate as to which species. But uh, for example, the Tushekpuk Lake area where the Tushekpuk herd has its calves and then around which it stays during much of the insect season, it is an international bird area um, designated by Audubon Society. And there are thousands of birds migrating, or at least that, tons of different species, probably actually millions of birds migrating from all over the world up to these areas. And a number of those do feed on the insects. Great. Um, I've also heard that there are some uh, Arctic dragonflies that probably help with that as well. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely. It's a, it's a whole complicated ecosystem where a lot of species feed on the insects, but still there are so many mosquitoes out there that they can have really <laughs> impacts on the caribou and other species. I'm, I would bet, um, which is a good segue into the next question. Uh, do the insects spread any, Ill any illness to the caribou or is it just the blood loss that affects them? That's a great question. I haven't heard directly about insect-borne diseases um, for the caribou. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but that's not something that I've heard a lot of concern about. Um, I know with the flies, so after the mosquitoes go out, then it tends to switch to um, various fly species. And some of those will actually, sorry, it's a little bit gross, but they'll kind of burrow into the nose around the eyes and they'll actually lay their eggs um, under the skin of the caribou. And so that can have other kind of detrimental effects too. Um, but yeah, it's a good question about disease. I'm not totally sure. Uh along that vein, what purpose do bot and warble flies serve? They seem to take such a toll on caribou. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by what purpose do they serve. I guess I'll have uh, two answers. One is that what effect do they have? Well, they do definitely drive distribution and movement. And so you see different patterns of movement when the flies are out um, versus when they're not. Um, in terms of, you know, what's the benefit of that to the caribou, that's a harder question to answer. It does get them moving around the landscape more, which probably spreads out the impact that they might be having on the environment. Um, but that's, yeah, probably a much more complicated question. Great, I think that is most of our insect questions that were thrown out. Um, let's see, do male caribou compete for and congregate harems of females like elk do? Yeah, good question. So uh, male caribou definitely do compete for females. Um, the rut, the mating season tends to happen around kind of during the time of fall migration. And so you'll get males that might um, uh, keep other males away from groups of females. It's that to the best of my knowledge, not quite as long lived as it might be, you know, for some other species, because they're all on the move, highly mobile. Um, during this time. But over space and time, yeah, they are excluding other males, kind of fighting with them and keeping them away from groups of females so that they can mate them. Do you know the function of antlers in female caribou? <laughs> That's a good question. It's one that gets debated um, a bit. Um, so I guess the short answer is maybe no, but there are potential benefits both for things like uh you know getting through brush maybe even accessing food at some times of year and then some kinds of defense uh, against predators you know the females keep their antlers a lot longer than the males do they actually keep the antlers until right around when the calves are born and then they tend to drop them off um, and so that suggests there's something different going on than the males where it clearly is tied to mating and then as soon as the rut's done they tend to drop those antlers off um, but yeah it's a good question always been a question of mine as well. So thank you. Um, are the Monte Carlo simulation predictions of impact based on areas where actual infrastructure is in place in caribou areas? So the studies that underlie the models are based on studies where actual infrastructures occurred. 
Um, those were mainly based on studies from where the central Arctic herd was, which is in the area of the Prudhoe Bay and Kuparik development a little bit to the east of the Tshekpuk herd main area. Um, and then we took the information learned in that area and we went and predicted it into the Tshekpuk herd range where there largely hasn't been infrastructure to date. They only just in the past few years have uh, kind of completed some infrastructure in those areas, but there's more that is predicted to occur. And so that's why it's really important, or not predict, I mean, some that's actively being permitted right now. And so it's important to understand what the impacts might be in those areas. So yeah, it builds upon studies done where there is infrastructure and caribou occurring, and then it applies it to areas where that isn't occurring yet to try to make decisions before you have things go in the landscape that you can't necessarily take out. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I have another question. Well, we have several. They're, they're coming in. Um, someone was wondering if climate change could impact the locations of the calving grounds and migration patterns, and if there's any evidence of that apparent now, or are there any models of projected climate change that predict impacts? Um, with the Arctic regions experiencing the greatest changes due to climate change and other impacts, um, they've heard about things like permafrost loss permafrost loss, it's a tongue twister, <laughs> and it could be, it seems like it could be significant. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so definitely there are a lot of changes going on in the Arctic right now, and the impacts of those changes of warming and permafrost melting and shrubs increasing and other things like that are likely to be varied and complex, but there is some work uh, that has come out recently that helps to give some suggestions for that. So the United States Geological Survey, USGS, put out a paper last year that looked at the porcupine caribou herd over in northeastern Alaska and at their calving range, both in the U.S. and in Canada. And then they looked at how selection of calving grounds and kind of the use of calving grounds varies based on when the vegetation gets green, when the snow melts off, and then they used climate simulation models to look at how those two things are predicted to change into the future and what that might mean for where the curve would go. So their study looked over, oh, I want to say it was like a 30 or maybe 50 year period, and the models predicted much heavier use of the Alaska part of the calving range, which is in the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Now, this is something that's very important as the state grapples with whether or not that area is going to be developed. It's something that was opened up for leasing under the Trump administration, and currently there are some efforts to see that uh, pulled back to protect the calving grounds for this caribou herd, which don't have the same kind of room to move as you've seen in other areas. So yeah, that is one study, for example, that has shown that where, where the animals tend to uh, have their calves and, and kind of how they distribute at calving time is predicted to shift. How that translates over for the Western Arctic herd or the Chekpuk herd, I haven't seen data on that yet, but it is an interesting question. Yeah, that's great. And sure you could elaborate even for a very long time on that type of question. Um, uh, why is the Western Arctic herd declining recently? Well, that is the multi-million dollar question. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, it's not as simple as just one answer. It probably is due to a multitude of things. So for one thing, we know that caribou herds do go up and down over time. There's some natural fluctuation. But we're seeing really strong declines in many caribou herds across their global range. Canada has seen many of their herds, in fact, the majority of their big herds have uh, been crashing in recent years. And so it's concerning that we've seen this decrease with the Western Arctic herd as well. Uh, the scientists who are out on the ground tracking things like the number of calves that are being born and how the females are doing have found that the calf numbers seem like they're okay, female survivorship seems like it's been a bit lower than on average um, of late. And that's probably due to multiple things. It's due to severe winter events, things like icing and rain on snow um, that can hinder them getting to their food. It could be due to uh, some effects of predation or of hunting. 
to some annual cycles, to other things like that. So it's probably a whole bunch of things all having a bit of an impact that build up to a more cumulative effect. But yeah, that's a really big thing that we're all kind of grappling with and trying to better understand, like on the Western Red Occurred Working Group. Great, thank you. Um, and we are just nearing eight o'clock. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time if you have to jump off. Um, we do have some more questions and Tim, it's up to you if you have some um, time to spare to answer the rest of the questions, we can do that. Um, or if there's a way people can contact you, they can ask their questions for follow-up. Um, but I will leave that up to you if you want to extend past eight o'clock. Yeah, I can take about one more and then I'm going to have to uh, get going. But definitely uh, more than welcome to send other questions. You can look me up at wilderness.org, the Wilderness Size website, and I believe my contact information is up there. Okay, great. Um, I will go by order that it was thrown into the batch. Um, we have a question, how much impact has disease had on the decline of this herd? And I'm assuming maybe the Western Arctic herd, but if there, that needs to be clarified, just let me know. But that's the yeah, it's a good question. It's not, uh, I am not nearly as much an expert in disease as I am in caribou movement patterns and things like that. Um, and I think it's hard to get really good data on disease. You know, the problem is even for the animals that are collared, we have a pretty decent idea of when the animals die because we can tell when they stop moving based on what the collar locations are showing. But often the scientists aren't able to get out there. These are really remote areas. There's no road access. You gotta go in by air in most cases. And so they're not able to get out there for sometimes weeks, even months. It might not be till the next summer they're able to get out to some of these places, but happens in late winter. And so by the time you get there, figuring out what was it that led this animal to die is really hard. Um, you do hear reports from some of the local people living in the area uh, with concerns about different disease or other things like that. Um, I haven't seen anything yet that quantifies how much of an impact that is having compared to these other factors. So yeah, it's something that is out there, but I don't think we have a good sense of to what degree that's contributing to any declines. Great. Well, that was all very helpful. Um, we have so many great questions that um, we didn't quite get to get to tonight, but as Tim said, he has some contact information. Um, if uh, you want to reach out to him, feel free to ask your questions. I'll also be relaying them back to him just so he has them. Um, but thank you so much. Um, again, Tim, thank you for your time. This was really excellent. Um, I haven't been in Alaska for long, so I have a lot to learn about caribou and I hope others learned a lot as well. This is really informative and um, very easy to grasp. So thank you. And I will stop the recording now for everyone.